Uh, not gonna lie, things have been a bit annoying recently. I've hit a bit of a rough patch. The whole thing kicked off a few months ago when I was just feeling pretty bad and empty for no real reason whatsoever. I simply felt that way because I did which was really, really fun. But because that alone wasn't enough, I managed to get stupid, dumb, dumb, stupid COVID. Uh, physically, I wasn't too ill. I was triple jabbed and all that. So, you know, everything was good on that end. But the actual worst part about it uh, was mainly just the fact that this was the fourth time that I've had to self-isolate during the pandemic. And, you know, you'd sort of expect or at least hope that after four times of doing this, I would know how to handle this whole thing mentally a bit better. Uh, but let me tell you that, that that was definitely not the case. With every time that I've isolated, I think it hit me harder and harder. And this time around, I just felt like absolute garbage. I felt like I was barely human. I was like a slob of meat just kind of flopping around from one location to the other. And then not too long after I finished isolating, I uh, also went through a breakup after a pretty long relationship. I'm not really gonna get into any details because I, I don't know any of you guys, you're all a bunch of strangers. All I will say is that it obviously made me feel quite sad, as you usually do after a breakup. It's very weird, you know, you're part of this thing, part of this unit for, in my case, almost the entirety of your adult life. And when that suddenly gets disconnected, it makes you kind of wonder about yourself, wonder about your self-image, you know? Who even is this guy? I don't know. But this next thing was really the cherry on top of this pile of crap that I had going on. And that was, uh, to make myself feel better, I did what lots of self-help gurus and just people in general tell you to do when you feel a bit down in the dumps. And that was uh, work out, eat healthy, read books, write lists scheduling my day, and a whole bunch of other stuff like that. These suggestions aren't all that bad. The main problem was that a month or two before that, I wrote a script for a short film for me to star in about a guy who tries to fix his life, fix the way that he feels by working out, eating healthy, reading books and writing lists. And eventually he sees how all these things don't actually help and everything crumbles in front of him. That moment when I realized that I was essentially living in my own script that I wrote, I, uh, yeah, it was, it was a bit bizarre to say the least. It felt like some kind of twisted divine joke that was being played on me. It, it, it was not good. But why am I telling you guys this? Am I doing it all so you guys feel bad about me and then decide to like this video and subscribe to my channel, leave a comment saying, Oh, finally, hope you're doing okay. Uh, maybe even check out my Patreon link in the description and give me loads of money. Absolutely not. B but if you do want to do those things, no, I'm telling you this because this really isn't anything special. We all have times like this where one bad event comes crashing down on us after another and we just feel worse and worse. We all have times where we feel incredibly unmotivated without a goal in life, completely and utterly aimless. And at times like these, when we're at our most vulnerable, that is exactly when the self-help vultures come swooping in to nibble on the corpse of our past happier self, just to, I don't know, get a little bit of money, I guess. When you look up stuff about the self-help industry, you always come across this insane number. Ah, oh, the self-help industry is valued at 10 or $11 billion. An outrageous number, to be honest. And it kind of makes you think, damn, this feels a bit wrong. I mean, people are making that much bank off of other people's weaknesses. I, I don't know if I like that very much. But then another question comes up, which is, what even counts as self-help? Is it just those gurus who tell you to wake up at four in the morning and the crack of fucking dawn when the birds are still asleep? Or, you know, can a fitness or weight loss instructor count as a self-help person? According to this article, yes, apparently. Are makeup channels technically part of the self-help industry? I mean, they help you put makeup on yourself, so. I'd say a person is part of the self-help world if they're either 
talking in a YouTube video or selling a book or a course that's there to give you, the person at home, the tools to fix this sort of hole in yourself, this thing that you feel like is missing deep inside of you. I'm gonna be talking about specifically self-help people on YouTube, and I also want to go over the implications of making this insane promise, this promise that they are going to be the ones to fix you, a person who they never ever met before in their life. I'm gonna be looking at this from very different angles. I wanna check out alternative self-help people on YouTube who talk about mindfulness and a bunch of stuff like that. I'll be looking at Gary V, who you guys probably know by now, and see how those things kind of contrast with each other. And I also mentioned a channel called Alux, which, uh, really, really hates poor people for some reason. I'm gonna keep an open mind though, who knows, maybe one of those tips and tricks can help fill the gap in my heart that can also be filled by your donations on patreon.com slash <laughs> Gary V, putting his very recent and prominent and kind of annoying NFT arc aside, because it's not very relevant to this video, Gary V is this rich entrepreneur dude who really ended up spawning some of the worst people I've ever met in my whole life, online and real life as well. In his inspirational videos, he very much perpetuates this idea of being on that grind, hustling, uh, working non-stop, all day, all night. I've swallowed every piece of gum that I've ever chewed in my life. I don't think it's cool or anything. I don't think it's fucking amazing. It's just the truth. I think it's efficiency. I don't think I want to give up the hundredth of a second putting in a napkin. When he was a kid, Gary used to steal flowers from his neighbor's front lawn and sell it back to them. Is that technically theft? Um, no. It's called being on that grind. Gary tells us that it's better to be born into nothing than to be born into a family with money. Why? Because uh, when you're poor and you make it, uh, you get to brag to people afterwards that you did that by being on that grind. And when you're rich, and you've always been rich, you don't get to do that. Which, which really, really sucks. You know what I think is a better advantage than f being born into something? Being born into nothing. People that have zero are like, this f guy's an idiot. That's because you don't talk to trust fund babies. I do. I talk to trust fund babies. They DM me. I meet them in real life because of my business career. They're f***ing sad. Huh. On one side, we got being sad because you already have a bunch of money. And on the other side, we have uh, being sad because you're crushed by debt and need to worry about how you're going to feed your family. Man, I really wonder which one's worse. There's this one video of his which I hate where a caller calls him and, uh, I don't know, asks him for advice or something. And he tells her that she needs to work non-stop, 24-7 for 10 whole years, taking no time for actual, you know, just pleasures in life. From 15 to 30, I didn't go anywhere on the weekends. Nowhere. Who did that? Who worked 18 hours a day for fucking 15 years like I did? Then sure, but there's people out there, Gary, that, that don't necessarily subscribe to that, right? That They're gonna lose. That don't think They're gonna lose. that that's not the way. I don't give a fuck about them. They're gonna lose. Putting that much of an emphasis on the need to be on that grind and just working yourself to death can be so, so crushing for so many different reasons. Not everyone is a born workaholic like Gary Vee and lots of people can actually break down from putting that kind of pressure onto themselves. Also, this might come as a surprise, but being very successful lots of times relies on just having lots of luck, being in the right place in the right time. Sometimes you could just work really, really hard to get something off the ground and absolutely nothing would happen. Let's say you want to be a YouTuber. You quit your day job, you have some money saved up, so you work 15 hours a day, every single day, all the time. You take no days off. You pump out videos left and right. You take time to study the algorithm. Your friends want to meet you. Your future wife wants to hang out with you. Absolutely not. I'm making videos, baby. But guess what? You post them one after the other and they all end up performing like actual shit. Why? Because maybe you're just not very lucky. Or maybe, just maybe, you're not very good at making videos at the moment. Th that can happen. It might take you three whole years of making stuff before you release anything that's actually worth watching. Or six years. Hell, I made videos from ages 11 to like 18, 19 that absolutely no one but my friends and family agreed to watch. 
and it was fine because I enjoyed making them. But if you're not doing it because you enjoy it and you're just doing it because that's part of the grind, then what happens next when you don't get the dopamine rush from getting views or money? What what keeps you going at the end of the day? You're just gonna end up feeling pretty useless, like you're worth less than what you actually are. You can't expect the grind to be the driving force in your life forever. I've swallowed every piece of gum that I've ever chewed in my life. A big problem that you might find in Gary's and lots of other self-help gurus videos is that they make these very, very big promises, title an inspirational video with words like, four minutes that might change your life which sounds quite promising, uh, but then you click on the video and realize that the guy's just talking lots and lots of nonsense. This morning, on a nice little Sunday, show him D-Rock, it's a nice Sunday. Yeah, that is a nice Sunday. I woke up with a chip on my shoulder to talk about this audacity, this fucking audacity that so many people have that they think they, that this one fucking person of eight billion, you, I'm talking to you, that your judgment if NFTs is a good idea or not, or if collecting marbles, show it, or collecting old Transformers, show it, or fucking some cup from the 1800s, show it. I went on a rant on Twitter. Notice the way he drags you into this, making you feel like what he's saying right now is the most important thing in the world. He's using words like audacity a lot in a very aggressive way. Oh, the audacity that people have. Oh, the audacity. Do I have this audacity? Is Gary V calling me out? Oh no. He swears a lot. He swears like a kid in middle school who just learned what the word fuck is. And all these things make it very hard for you as the viewers to not notice and pay attention to what he's saying. But, but what is he saying exactly? What the hell is he even going on about? This, this, this lunatic on the loose. Uh, collectible fucking sneakers are smart, but Thundercats are not. Jackson Pollock, good. Sports cards, bad. Sports cars, good. Fucking handbags. Who the f do you think you are? All he's saying, literally, is that you should keep an open mind to investing in more than one thing. You have the ability to invest in both NFTs and old Transformer dolls that cost thousands and thousands of dollars. He said that this might change my life. Change my whole life right there in four minutes. Do I not know that I can invest in more than one thing? It, it's just very expensive. It's very expensive to buy a transformer toy for $4,000. Most people don't have that kind of money. When Gary's confronted with this insane, insane idea that some people may not have the money to buy a marble that costs as much as a car, his answer is always something along the lines of, Hey, if you want money, stop buying $5 coffee at Starbucks. And he keeps repeating that again and again and again, this mantra of his. Wait a minute, you keep telling all of us that you didn't make any money, but how'd you have money to invest in Facebook, Uber, and Twitter? I went on no vacations, I bought no $4 coffee. Don't let me hear that you're broke as fuck. And the first fucking story I click on, you're drinking a $7 fucking coffee. Oh, stop buying $5 coffee, stop buying uh, Netflix. It's like, dude, I I don't even like coffee all that much, okay? I'm I'm more of a tea guy, and I'll be honest with you, I don't think I've saved that much money because of my, my tea liking. For a lot of these people, the answer to what will make you happy is either one of two things. If you're on the Gary side of things, the hustle itself, the privilege to be on that grind is where you'll find salvation. This is the thing that will bring you true joy in life. You need to wake up every single day at 5 a.m thankful that you get the chance to work yourself to death today. And the other side of this is pretty simple. Money will bring you happiness. Money is like some of these people's god. They worship money. They talk about it in an almost religious way. Money flees the hands that don't work for it. Have you ever noticed how those who are bad with money can never seem to keep a hold of it? Even if fortune hits them in the face, it only takes a couple of years for them to get back to the place they started in. This is because money doesn't like people who don't work for money, so it flees to find new owners. I want to introduce to you this channel called Alux, one of the most evil-feeling channels that I've ever encountered on my time on YouTube. I found out about them from this video that Big Joel made about them. I love Big Joel so much. He's one of my favorite YouTubers of all time. These guys are so, so weird when talking about money and 
specifically poor people, they just really, really hate poor people in a in such a vile way. The way that they portray the poor is as this disgusting, filthy, and greedy class of people that are there just to kind of suck the money out of the rich people's pocket. 15 things rich people do that the poor don't. Welcome to Alux.com, the place where future billionaires come to get inspired. In this one, we're going to cover some actions that the rich take while the poor neglect, either because they don't have the knowledge or simply don't want to. Yeah, uh, that should be interesting. The rich sleep less than the poor. Here's the hard truth. The majority of poor people end up poor because they lack the determination to escape their circumstances. Let's dive a little deeper into this because it's really important to understand what we mean when we say poor people are lazy. Yeah, you know those people who wake up at like 5 a.m. sometimes earlier for their factory job? Yeah, <sighs> these people are so, so lazy. Honestly, get a grip, you lazy slobs of shit. Yeah, um, I, I gotta know, what's the source for that information? You can't just make the claim that poor people wake up later than rich people, no matter what. You gotta, you gotta actually, you know, bring some proof to that. You can't just say things, eh, Lux? Poor people are often lazier than the rich in the early days. We know that some of you will be bothered a lot by the previous statement, but statistically, it's the truth. Oh, okay, that explains it. If you add the word uh, statistically before what you're about to say, that essentially uh, turns it into a fact. But statistically, it's the truth. That's that's good to know. I mean, I'm, I'm going to keep that one in mind for later. I've been living on and off in London for about a year and a half now. And statistically speaking, scientifically and truthfully and statistically speaking, do you know how many YouTubers I got to know here who are quite well off financially that just wake up in the most disgusting hours of the day? Wake up like 4 p.m. when there's one hour of sunlight left in here. Yeah, it's absolutely all of them. They, they all do that. We know that some of you will be bothered a lot by the previous statement, but statistically, it's the truth. These are not poor people by any means, and they have the most garbage sleep schedule in the whole world, maybe. Honestly, if you think that any of the advice that you're gonna find on this channel is gonna turn you rich, I'm sorry, but you're an idiot. You're really, really, really dumb. There's like one bit where they go on about how rich people eat healthier than poor people, kind of ignoring what leads to that situation. Poor people eat fast food. Health is really important, and many poor people have no interest in knowing what's in their food, what an actual healthy meal should look like, or barely know anything about nutrition. Poor people are dumb, that's why they keep buying junk food. It's not because in places like America it's just way, way cheaper than buying any sort of vegetables. No, they're doing it willingly because they're really stupid. Also, there's lots of rich people that eat very horribly too. I mean, Warren Buffett, this guy's worth what, like, $115 billion? He eats, like, McDonald's every single day, drinks five cans of Coke, um, eats Dairy Queen every single day as well. I, I don't know about you, I wouldn't count that as a healthy diet. They also go on about how disgusting poor people are and how they decide to never shower. Number six, poor people don't shower as often as rich people do. Initially, we thought this was just a made-up fact, but it turns out to be true. Apparently, it's true. Source? Nah. Nah. Nah, I'm not giving you that. Both these guys and Gary Vee kind of repeat this idea that you should be always working non-stop, all day, all night. You shouldn't be doing things like watching sports, because watching sports is for poor people, apparently. Poor people are really into sports. You shouldn't be uh, watching movies on Netflix. You shouldn't be going on vacations, according to Gary Vee. But what if those things manage to make you happier? What if those things manage to make your day a bit better? Like, isn't that worth something at all? Just enjoying your life? I want to bring up a guy called Nathaniel Drew. He isn't really a self-help guru. He is really just a guy who's at the moment struggling with the same things that he talks about with his viewers. And he often admits to that as well. Lots of these hustlers and grinders like Gary Vee make sure to present this very envy-inducing image of their life that they have everything kind of settled already. They've figured everything out. You know, they, they know what kind of person they are. They present this notion 
that they've already done it. They managed to fix everything and anything about themselves. In contrast, Nathaniel and channels like him make sure to actively point out how for them, that's not really the case. They're at the moment trying to resolve the thing that they're talking about, which feels so refreshingly honest compared to what I've just had to sit through. I can't control what's gonna be interesting to people. I can't control how the algorithms are gonna go, but it's still a struggle for me. And I just mentioned that just to make the point that like, I'm not saying this from the point of view of like a, a guru, you know? I'm, I'm trying to figure this out for myself as well. It makes me feel a lot more comfortable with Nathaniel's videos. And in general, I think that if you're gonna do self-help, and you wanna do it ethically, honesty is really the key. There isn't an ultimate way of living. That's not a thing. Everyone's different and different things would help them more than others. And if you decide to pretend that anything other than that is the case, then you're setting a very impossible goal for people to reach. And you're a deceiving piece of shit. As I was working on the script for this video, Nathaniel posted a video of his own titled, Why is your life slipping by so quickly? And, you know, uh, that, that's definitely something I'm terrified by, so uh, why not give it a watch? Let's, let's do that. In the video, he goes over how as someone who really wants to take in the most out of life as possible, it really scares him when he notices how unbearably fast life is speeding by as he gets older. So this video is essentially just him going over the things that he personally did to make that feeling a bit better, to try and make time move a bit more slowly than it currently does. I want to live life as fully as I possibly can. And so for a long time, I thought, okay, if I throw myself into as many new experiences as I possibly can, life won't feel like it's flying by so quickly. Oh, hell yeah. That's good to know that that worked for him. I mean, th that's essentially what I'm trying to do. So, ha, took some weight off my shoulders. What can I- Spoiler alert, it's still flying by pretty quickly. Make <sighs> Man, I'm not gonna go over the entirety of the video. I will just say that at the end of it, he mentions that one of the ways that he personally found that can kind of help slow down time is actually for real going out of your comfort zone and not this bullshit kind of going out of your comfort zone, you know, skydiving, bungee jumping, skiing. All these things are just like adrenaline rush fun. No, but he was talking about things that actually for real bring you discomfort. And as an example, he brings up lots of his friends who went to do a Vipassana and how they claim that those 10 days that they spent over there felt really like 10 months. And I guess that makes sense. Being bored out of your mind would do that to you. It would feel like like forever. And something that I found to be pretty interesting is that he admits that even though he knows that doing this thing, doing a Vipassana might help him with his own predicament, he never actually tried doing that. Maybe because he knows that it might be a bit too uncomfortable. Him saying that again strengthens this notion to me that this guy isn't this all-knowing being slash wizard. He's more or less just sharing his train of thought about a topic that I think crossed all of our minds at some point or another. There are many channels that are kind of like Nathaniel's giving advice in the same sort of way. And if you watch a lot of their content, which I did for this video, you start noticing an insane amount of patterns that keep repeating themselves from video to video. Lots of them talk about the power of mindfulness, keeping your mind and your essence in the moment. They suggest doing things like journaling. They all dress in a pretty simplistic way, wearing very basic colors. And if you want to find any of these people, just look up on YouTube how to stop procrastinating and a, a billion of them would show up. It seems like all of them have made a video about that topic at one point or another. And if you'd click on any of these videos, you'd realize that they usually start them in a pretty similar way, often sharing a personal story about something, an experience that happened to them, that very much relates to the topic at hand. A lifelong concern of mine has been... Like lots of students, back in college, I almost always... Not gonna lie, things have been a bit annoying recently. I've hit a bit of a rough patch. They use a shit ton of quotes. If you'd click on any of their videos and just skip to a random point, there's more of a chance that you'd land on a quote than, than not. I promise you. Nelson Mandela said, I learned that courage was not the absence of fear, but the triumph over it. As Stephen Pressfield writes, resistance cannot be seen, heard, touched, or smelled. Mark Twain said, if it's your job to eat a frog. It's almost like they're in this mindfulness cult. I feel like if I keep talking shit too much, I'm going to get abducted by a guy wearing a beige sweater. Just kidding. No hate. I actually have nothing against these guys. I, the last thing I want to do in this video is start beef with alternative self-help YouTube. I think you can definitely find a lot of value in their videos. I mean, they share pretty good tips every now and again. If it's a topic like procrastination, the tips could range from something like 
uh, counting to three and then doing it at three no matter what, or being hyper aware and even writing down distractions that you may have before doing the task so you can avoid them better heading on. And all these things are great. Having more tools to deal with your life is a good thing, and no matter what. But something you should watch out from is that after you watch these videos and essentially any sort of self-help type video in any kind of field, after watching that, you get a pretty good feeling in your stomach. You feel pretty damn good about yourself. You suddenly get this rush of dopamine into your brain and this fake self of accomplishment. And you may think to yourself, wow, this is it. I did it. I solved procrastination. I'm a, I'm a legend. Wow, these videos are pretty good. Maybe I should watch more, get some more tips, which might result in you watching 10 videos about how to stop procrastinating when you have an essay that you need to hand in tomorrow. Self-help books and videos have the potential of actually helping you, but if you don't actually act on any of these things and just keep on consuming self-help content, obviously nothing is gonna happen. You just end up replacing one bad habit for another. Instead of procrastinating, you end up watching videos about how to stop procrastinating. You feel very nervous by the concept of going on a date, so instead you decide to watch 50 videos that explain to you how to act in this situation and how to do this and what to say when the other person does this and that and whatever instead of actually going out there and talking to people in real life. Self-help can act as this sort of imaginary shelter, something between your current sucky life and your next life, life 2.0. And it feels quite safe to be in this shelter, to constantly be in this state of mind that, hey, tomorrow or next week or in a month, I'm gonna be doing this thing. I'm gonna be headed towards a whole new me. Everything is gonna be great. I'm gonna be killing it. You might have noticed that it took me a while to release this video and the last one. And that's for multiple reasons, really. One of them is just the fact that they take me quite a while to make. I mean, I've been making pretty long videos recently. Um, so if you want to give me money on Patreon. <laughs> Another reason is that I lost my camera in Portsmouth uh, while I was filming my short film. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm an idiot. And because I was and still kind of am dealing with the stuff that I mentioned at the beginning of this video. I was feeling like crap and I found it pretty hard to work on a script and try to write jokes and stuff like that. I, I feel like that's pretty understandable. So instead, I decided to take some time off slash procrastinated like crazy. And during my procrastinating adventures, I managed to find this channel called Samurai Matcha, a Japanese teacher slash minimalist that shows his life through his videos. I found his videos to be so unbelievably calming and relaxing. And I think there was a moment where I was watching this stuff and a thought crossed my mind. I was like, man, this looks pretty sick. This looks quite nice. I should be a minimalist, you know? I should leave everything behind, go to some remote area in the middle of nowhere, live in a cabin, and just kind of enjoy the simplicity of my life. I was very clearly lying to myself. I have no intention of becoming a minimalist anytime soon. But in my head, it was really nice to think that I was gonna do that, that I was gonna be that. I do this a lot, actually. I really like the idea of physically getting away from my problems. Uh, I used to feel pretty crap back home, so I decided to move to the UK and see how that goes. About half a year ago, I felt really, really weird here in the UK, and I was like, hey, maybe I should go to Guatemala and look at a bunch of volcanoes and stuff like that. But recently, I managed to lose my passport, kind of ties into me losing my camera as well. I'm an idiot. Which made it so I essentially had to stay here and deal with how I'm feeling at the moment. I couldn't just run away and live some really cool, epic version of my life, which which is pretty nice. That's a pretty nice option to have. And at first, not gonna lie, it was absolutely horrible. I felt like garbage every single day. It just felt like I was walking around carrying this um, weight at the top of my stomach. But then after a while, I decided to try and look for ways to make my current life that I'm living, my normal life, to just be a bit better. And while meditating and mindfulness aren't really my thing, I find these things a bit boring. Um, swimming definitely is. I find that pretty fun. And let me tell you, those 40 minutes that I'm in the water are the only time in my day where my mind is just fully focused on the act that I'm doing at the moment. I'm not thinking about anything else, just my breathing, my technique. I'm fully present and kind of love that. I've been reading a lot more books, not for any deep reason, 
just because I kind of like it. I, I deserve to do things that I kind of like. And more recently, I just find myself enjoying doing the most mundane things ever. I could be going on a walk, listening to a song I really like, and having the absolute time of my life. So yeah, for the first time in a while, I can confidently say that I pretty enjoy living right now. I find it pretty fun. And while I am fully aware that the happiness that I'm feeling right now is not gonna last forever, I'm not gonna feel like this all the time, always, I'm also aware that the next time that I feel pretty bad, it's not gonna last forever as well. And, uh, yeah. Find that pretty comforting, I guess. Thank you for my lovely patrons for giving me money. That's pretty nice of you, that's pretty cool. If you want to support me as well, I think you already know what the link is at this point. It's also in the description, it would help me out a ton. These videos take so damn long to make, so any sort of financial help like that is pretty great, in my opinion. Check out my Twitter, at Pinely with two Ys, and my Instagram, at PinelyBox, if you want to see a picture of me uh, with a bunch of balls next to me. Also, uh, big, big news, my short film is officially done. I finished it by the time it took me to finish this video. Um, it's probably up on my second channel, Mr. Pinely, right now. Took me quite a... Sirens are going off. They're, they're pretty excited that I finished the film as well. Uh, took me quite a while to make. It's It was a big project for me. It's very, very much tied into the subject of this video. So, I mean, yeah, go give it a watch. It's like the first kind of project like this that I'm making outside of a program like school. So, it's pretty exciting. I have a lot to learn, but I'm, I'm also pretty proud of it. So, that's, that's a good position to be in. Uh, okay, besides that, goodbye!